Hello, my name is Sagal Farah and this is Charlie Phillips and we're here today in the Story Club at Paddington Central to celebrate Black History Month. So Charlie Phillips is a British Caribbean photographer who was one of the first to capture the lives of black people living in North Kensington. As his career progressed, he had his work featured in Harper's Bazaar, Life, Italian Vogue and at numerous galleries, including Tate Britain, v &A, and the Museum of the City of New York. As well as capturing street life, he has also photographed protests and celebrities across Europe and has published some of his photography in his book, Notting Hill in the 60s. So welcome, Charlie Phillips. Thank you for coming today. Oh, thanks for reminiscing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Um, 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 well, you know, our history has been finally um, given the platform, so thanks for having me. Definitely, thank you for coming yeah. today and for sharing your story. Well, I hope you pass history alive, pass the culture alive and our history alive because we still haven't been given the proper platform. And we've got to start telling our side of the story as Definitely. well. Definitely, and that's what we'll there. be doing today. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Great, so firstly, I'd like to show you two pictures that you took in, I believe, the 50s or 60s. Oh yeah, that's the 60s. Yeah, in that's the 60s. West London. I, I, the British fashion, just down the road there, yes. Yeah, and so I wanted to ask, what was it like having West London as a subject of your photography and why West London? I came here in 1956 and um, it was a big um, surprise cultural exchange. Yeah? Yeah. This is how it kind of started. And um, I started taking photographs and with my paper round money, one day I went to Boots Chemist yeah? and um, I bought a book called Do It Yourself Photography for three and six, three shillings and six months. That's about um, 45p in our day's money. Huh? And that's where it actually started. And I used to um, do my prints in the, when my parents used to go to bed at night time, I used to um, print up in the bathroom at the time. And that's how, and over the years I've accumulated, but I've lost a lot of my work. I've lost, lost, I lost a, my, a lot of my work because um, 50 years later, the ones that's been salvaged, people still ask me, did I really take them? What happens now, um, over the years as well, yeah, the, 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 some of the institutions has finally come to terms that we do have a story, that our history was exist. And I wasn't commissioned to take any of these photographs, but I thought I'd take them growing up in London to one day I'll tell our, style, our side of the story. Mm -hmm. so our history has always been documented by outsiders, more or less, yeah, and um, and uh, one of the things that surprised me, yeah, uh, 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 one of the things that really surprised me was you had a curator once who looked at me and says, my gosh, did this really exist? We didn't know a community <laughs> like this existed. Mm. And yeah, and sometimes I get sarcastic, yeah, and say, did you really take this? Mm. You know, so these are the things I went through, yeah? Yeah, I think it's really beautiful that it came from a sort of, natural place and it wasn't forced upon you and you know you I took it in my own time I exactly. wasn't commissioned yeah. yeah I think you can see like the rawness in the pictures and you can tell that it's like it's very different that you took it and you're within the community and you've got that sort of access to oh, yeah. everyone in the community as well you can really sense that intimacy in the pictures thank you yeah, yeah. and I also wanted to ask how would you feel if you were to sort of take photographs in North Kensington today as you took it before in the pre-gentrified and pre-Grenfell North Kensington, do you think you'd feel as comfortable doing that in this day and age? No, I don't think so. I, I don't think I could fit in these days because North Kensington has been gentrified. Yet that community is a very rich community with history, with culture, but it's been suppressed. Yeah, That community has produced one of the biggest events in Europe or worldwide. What other community can attract two million people over a weekend? Yeah, and you'd think the people who was in charge of our culture, the institution of London, would have embraced it culturally, socially, artistically. Yeah, 
It's our creation. It's part of British culture because if it wasn't being emancipated, we would be celebrating carnival. I have one of your pictures actually from Notting Hill Carnival. That's one of the first pictures of the day. I was aroused. Yeah. Oh gosh, that brings back <laughs> that brings back memories. Yeah. yeah I was in my dark room and I heard all this commotion and I thought, what commotion is happening outside? Yeah. And um, I was there. That was the first carnival on the streets. Yeah. I was a day I will always remember as well. Yeah, certain things when you see photographs brings back memories. Your generation hasn't heard our side of the story. Mm. Yeah, your generation didn't know people like us existed to document growing up in London. Yeah, growing up in England anyway, and it's mm. there. Yeah, it's a bit. Of, it's, oh, it's, it's, it is the missing gap with uh, within the urban history. The urban history still hasn't been properly documented by urban people. People who actually live in the urban area. Definitely, and it's really important for the younger generation to see these photographs because it is really empowering to know that, you know, there was a whole generation before them. And what was it like? Like, what were the differences between documenting the lives of black people in North Kensington in comparison to when you went across Europe and you were doing things such as photographing protests and celebrities? Do you think that it sort of allowed you to be labelled just as a photographer rather than always being labelled as a black photographer? Or do you think that you still had to carry that with you even when you were in Europe? I still don't like to be um, classed as a black photographer because many a times I come into conflict with um, the institutions, i.e. for instance um, there was another English photographer who took early work of Notting Hill mm -hmm. and they wanted me to have an exhibition alongside him. And this is when we get drawn in the colour thing and the political thing. And I said, what do you want to... Oh, we want to get it from a black point of view. So I said, um, oh, come here, if a white man takes a photograph and a black man takes a photograph, can you tell the difference? And this is the thing I get caught up in sometimes, which I try to avoid. Mm -hmm. I don't really want to get caught up in, 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 in the colour thing, but sometimes this is how they judge you. And it still goes on, yeah? And it's not till about... Um, uh, 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 15 years ago, they discovered I was a photograph, photographer of colour, put it that way. But, but my time in abroad was more acceptable because they um, opened the doors more for me. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, and when I came back to England, people, and sh with my portfolio, People used to look at me and showed it all around to the galleries. They looked at me and said, did you really take that? <laughs> and they used to fob me off. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So lucky enough, um, outside it is, you know, it's a, it was a white woman who used to sell some of my work for mm. me. For my next question, I have these two photographs I wanted to show you that you've taken. Oh, my gosh. Oh, God. <laughs> You're really going in through my archives, yeah? <laughs> I oh, really gosh. loved the one at the top with Hakeem Jamal in the uh, middle. Hakeem Jamal, this is when, yeah. this was the era, there was the um, anti-apartheid movement when we step, this was the Vietnam era. Yeah. And Amal Jamal came over and um, they had the Black People's Information Centre. This is when the era where we were going through a lot of police brutality, where a lot of people were fitted up. So the SOS law came in and, you know, Amal Jamal came over and gave us some support, you know. What caught my eye in particular was a sort of fusion in this picture between the African-American civil rights movement and the black British racial struggle. I feel like a lot of the times when it comes to black creatives in terms of photographers and writers and activists and all these creatives, a lot of the times when they're British, their work is often overlooked yes, in comparison yes. to African-American creatives. Yeah, and so I wanted to ask, what was it like navigating that as a black British photographer? Well, well things, uh, my personal opinion, things hasn't been changed mm -hmm. because the, 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 the black culture that you see in England, it's too Americanized. Mm. I had an argument when um, a few years ago they had the Black Poe exhibition at the V&A mm -hmm. and it was exactly the same thing that we could have, from artists over here, that, but they import. People, when they think about um, black culture, black culture isn't uh, just about Malcolm X or Martin Luther King, mm. you know, or, 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 or Marcus Garvey. There's others, uh, prominent people in England 
and from the colonies as well, mm. who's done amazing work, but they've been left out of history. And that's why I think I really liked this photo with that fusion. Of it was a fusion, yeah, yeah. It was cooperation at the time, yeah. But there should be more cultural exchange, yeah, uh, from across the pond and from uh, the African continent. That's what I feel personally. You know. But what was this area like before in the 50s and in the 60s? When I was a teenager, 18, 19, there used to be one of the first black clubs in in um, Prate Street called the Q Club. Okay. And at night time, at weekends, I used to sneak out when my parents go, go to bed <laughs> and um, go down there. This, that was a, um, don't forget as well, it was a time when um, um, places like Adam Smith Pallia or, or the um, Lyceum, yeah, didn't play our type of music. So they opened this club called the Q Club, and it was an home for soul music. That ev that's even been left out of British history, where music is concerned, where our contribution to what is now British popular music mm. has been left out. But the Q Club was a great place because um, you used to have a lot of the top artists, and even some of the top British artists, yeah, they used to go down there to listen to the rhythm and blues and the soul music, mm -hmm. yeah. I can't call in the names, but they know who they are. They know who they are, yeah? Coming to think of it, my first recollection of Paddington, I always remember when they had the steam train, yeah? We oh, came wow. in from Liverpool or somewhere like that. And this is where my parents came and met me on August afternoon, the 18th of August, 1956. I always remember, and we came in by a steam train. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the first time. That was a, that was a new experience mm -hmm. of my coming in. And um, one of the things I always remember some of the people who came on that boat train, the boat train it was called, the boat train. And boy, I always remember we were dapper. <laughs> yeah, that's a part of British fashion. Yeah, because if you look at some of the old Windrush generation, we didn't mm. come as any destitute immigrants who came here with response to the mother country. But Paddington Station, but, but it used to be, um, it used to be uh, um, when, the, when the steam trains used to come in and the, Pack, you used to have a train called the Packet because sometimes um, you used to see it pass by when you were in um, West Bend Grove as well because I used to do a paper around there. But I wasn't a train enthusiast. Clearly, you can yeah, tell. I remember that steam train coming yeah. in from Liverpool or Plymouth, yeah. Yeah. And on Wednesdays and um, Tuesdays and Thursdays, though, it was time that the boat train used to come in mm. and you used to see other people meeting other people, yeah. Yeah. But this is it. We didn't, a lot of us didn't come in as a destitute immigrant. We were answered the call to the mother country. For instance, my parents didn't have to come here because they had you know, eight people working for them, but they were so enthusiastic to see what the mother country looks like. And mm. you know, some of them got tied up and couldn't, couldn't uh, go back. I had a few auntie figures. We used to work in this. I can't, could recognize a place because the, the hospital was a... Uh, oh, St. Mary's. St. Mary's, a maternity hospital as well. Some of the um, first generation of the Windrush, they were all born there, mm. St. Mary's Hospital. It's, it's, that's been documented properly, but a lot of the Afro-Caribbean nurses they used to work and do the night shift. Mm. Uh, and, um, yeah, our contribution as well. Yeah, a lot of them basically built the NHS, and I think that's been right. forgotten. And, and, and this was a, I can't remember if there was a training hospital as well, but this is where they first came to train as well. Mm -hmm. I think our side of the story hasn't been properly documented. It hasn't been told from a grass, put it that way, a grassroots level. Mm -hmm. yeah? yeah, that's why it's so important to have these conversations and yeah. remind you know, each generation of our history. As a poet myself. Poet, yeah. Yeah, a lot of the times I find inspiration through photography and different artistic disciplines. And so I wanted to ask, in terms of your photography, has it ever been put in conversation with other artistic disciplines like photography or like, sorry, poetry or other creative outlets? And how do you think this has impacted your own personal growth and your experience as a photographer? <sighs> This is another thing that keeps me going as well. I've been I've inspired a lot of poets, the up and coming poets, mm -hmm. with my photography. Um, I've inspired a lot of up, well, old musicians because they use some of my photographs 
on record covers. Mm. London is the place for me, or f is one popular one. Um, I've inspired um, lo lots of uh, young writers. Mm -hmm. And you know the thing that keeps me going? A lot of young students want to do their dissertation on me. Oh, and yes. I've done about 17, in, been interviewed for about 17, you know, 17 dissertations already. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah amazing. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and this is what keeps me going. As I said, there has been a missing gap with our history. Mm. Our parents never tell us anything. And now your generation has got a very inquisitive mind. They want to know things. So, mm. seriously. Yeah, definitely. I think it's really important, especially when people reach, you know, their late teens, that's when they start asking questions and researching their history. And another thing that surprises me, a lot of young white kids, especially in the urban areas of London, yeah, want to hear our story. And it's not, I hope one day it becomes part of the educational system, yeah. And this is why the culture of London of England's changed because you have a lot of young white kids who are interested in the music in their hearts, but it's never in school, it's always outside the school, it's outside the educational system. Like for instance, a few months ago, you know, I was, I, I, I don't know, smaller parents, parents, I don't know, these nine-year-old kids say, Oi, mister, you're famous, ain't you? I was like, oh, oh we saw you on the internet. Yeah? Wow. And the new, these are nine-year-old kids. Yeah. You know, so, shows you again there's a missing gap because our, 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 our platform isn't really, has been really um, established as how it should. And in terms of you photographing at funerals, what was that like? I know you've got your collection called oh, How Great. Great Art Thou? Yeah, 50 Years of Afro-Caribbean Funerals. What was it like? No, well, um, that's a very important documentary as well, yeah? Documents I've done, yeah? because I photographed my first funeral in 1959. My auntie died. Mm -hmm. And um, over the years, over the years, especially not a, a lot of, we're coming up to the seventh generation now, whether you like it or not. We're coming up to the seventh oh, from wow. the Winros, the seventh generation. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I didn't know I had this, I didn't know I had this collection of work another section of my archive that had a lot of funeral photos. Some of them are family, some of them are friends. So I thought I'd document the moment, yeah? Well, over the years, over the last 50 years, how the culture has changed. We're coming up to the seventh generation. The attitude has changed. And um, Caribbean, Afro-Caribbean funerals isn't about celebrating someone's death. It's about celebrating someone's life. Now, over the last three generations, things have changed because we used to have a strict dress code. Yeah, black, lilac, or white. It used to be the basic dress code. Yeah? The theme song would be a song called How Great Thou Art. And bless my soul, my savior unto thee. How great thou art. How, okay, well, Guess what the main theme song could be now in, 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 in 2020? What? Frank Sinatra done it my way <laughs> while the coffin is going down. Regrets, I've had a few. I travel each and every by way. Or simply the best. So the religious side of it and the cultural side of it is completely gone. So it's changed as some, another aspect of the culture, our, our, our culture being declined and moving on. So that's what our great art was all about. Mm. Yeah, and from the pictures, I think the main thing that stood out was how colourful the funerals were. And like you said, it seemed more like a celebration of life rather it's than... It's a celebration of life, yeah. Yeah, it's a celebration, yeah. And in terms of when you were photographing the funerals, was everyone sort of comfortable with you documenting that? Or? Well, it came then, no, a lot of people knew me for over the years. And if I'm not at a funeral in West London, everyone would ask me. Oh. And then they started to call me the dead man's photographer. So that's when it got... Uh, <laughs> I yeah, became the dead man's photographer, but Great. but it's part of her culture that's been overlooked as well. Mm. So I thought I'd document that side of her culture as well. Wow. And lastly, I just wanted to ask, what is the role of street photography in telling the truth about people in areas of poverty that are often overlooked, such as North Kensington in the 50s and the 60s? Well, I'm, I'm, I was glad around to take whatever street photography I had at the time. Nobody 
want, yeah, wanted to see them. As I said, I wasn't commissioned, but it was part of my community that I lived in, and I, I, I just took it as it was, yeah. Um, uh, Do you think it did anything It has been proved anything. It has, it, okay. it ha I personally think, we have a document to look back, but it hasn't improved anything. Nothing has improved because people are still living in misery and destitute, yeah, it hasn't, but it's there, and hope, um, you know, um, the, the, the institutions will learn or pick up from it and make people's life better. It's so interesting just hearing your outlook on, you know, your photography in West London. I really appreciate you taking the time out. Thank well, you so much. You know, thanks for having me. It's been you know, lovely Keep the culture alive you. and keep the history alive. Definitely. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Yes, thank you. This really comes back to, again, what I feel is um, this idea of the decisive moment that Charlie captures. If you look in this picture quite closely, you can see the alignment of his arms, almost perfectly circular, and the hands, right? Really kind of goes in with the, the famous London design, um, on the transport design here, on this side here, with some circles. So the whole thing, Charlie manages to get that particular moment where you capture these sort of natural geometries and, that, and that's an example of what I mean by the urban eye and it's the kind of talent that Charlie has. A lot of people see this picture as a kind of symbol of enduring love, you know, love conquers everything, you know, conquers the interracial thing, We're not supposed to be together in the 1960s and this, you know, this, they love, you know, it's a really powerful image. What is the real story about this image? No, the real story about this image, you know, was at a party and this guy was dancing up close to the girl, you know, typical West Indian style, you know. <laughs> this was before the wall was invented. I don't know which generation remember the wall dance, but this was before the wall. I think it was one of the, um, uh, I don't know if any of the senior citizens can remember Johnny is forever, my darling, my love, yeah? It was like that. And I saw this couple dancing, and I said, hold on, hold on, let me take a snap of you, you know? So I don't know what happened after they just stand and I just captured it. I'm well known for taking a lot of candid shots, you know, because as I said, you know, I usually shoot and ask questions after, you know? <laughs> and this is one of my most iconic shots, you know? And a lot of that the idea about shooting first and then asking questions later, that came from your stint as being a... A paparazzi, artist. yes, yes, because... In um, Italy. In Italy, I was there during La Dolce Vita year, you know, we're sitting up here at the Spagna and waiting for Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor. At the time, you know, they were like... Um, like uh, Beckham and Spice now, you know? And, um, you know, it's a thing you'd have a lot of patience, you know? And uh, instead of being the Mr. Nice guy, I said, please, can I take a photograph? You just shoot, run and ask with him. I wasn't commissioned to do it. And it's the first time our history has been told by our people. You know, usually they have the Sunday Times and uh, somebody who comes into an area and they think they know everything about the area, you know? And they show us, half of the time they show us in a very degrading way, like drug addicts are this and hustlers and pips and all that. Something scandalous, yeah? And this is what, this is what actually, um, a challenging institution. You know, I wasn't commissioned. I'd done it growing up as part of our history and to correct history. Black and white couple, for instance, yeah? Um, people have an interest in it more from a sociological point of view than a historical point of view. It has um, people as more interest in it probably because maybe of its natural beauty as well. But um, people analyze it as well. Um, some of the people who who asks me about it, they have a social interest, whether in sociology, psychology, historically, stop, you know? But apart from a, 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 a cultural point of view, no. But then 
there's always people now who's willing probably to hijack that image, hijack that image and probably use it maybe for propaganda purposes. And you know, it's a very, um, f photography is a very sensitive um, subject as well because it can be manipulated in different ways as well. Yeah, and especially with this digital world. This love has no color. And then they say the camera never lies, you know? It's just that particular moment you just captured these two people who probably were in love and uh, you know, love has no color, yeah? That is what photography is about too, catching the moment. Ownership of our images is always very, very important. But now we're living in a digital world, you know? I've seen plenty of my work all over the place. And um, 30 years have been passed and you haven't got no copyright ownership anymore after 30, 40 years. I think that's the law, yeah? And then um, this is how they've got me out of retirement because sometimes I do see uh, images just popping up all over the place and there's nothing I can do about it. I can just um, think about the memory, it gives me a bit of status, yeah? We really haven't got full ownership of our image. We can control it up to a limit, but full ownership, yeah, of our image we haven't got because it cannot be easily manipulated, especially in the digital world. It's not just images, you've got to talk about our history, our culture, that's been hijacked so many a times, you know? But there's no such thing as having 100% ownership of our culture or our history because it's been manipulated, it's already been hijacked. Yeah? Unless we stick together as a strong community and defend each other. But there's always someone out there willing to sell your culture and your, uh, you know, your talent for a price. But we can't own it 100%. It's been hijacked from our music, our culture, images and all that. It's been hijacked. There's nothing you can do about it. I really didn't want to be a photographer. I wanted to be an opera singer or a naval architect. And look, you know, my youth employment officer, if I tell him I wanted to be a photographer, he'd laugh his head off. All they encouraged me is to be a bus conductor or a bus driver or work on London Transport in the post office, you know. But I went here to do other things, yeah? Um, photography came in not by accident because I've always had an interest in visual images as well. And at the time growing up, in a one room, a family of four in one room. I thought I'd uh, document my life. Now, life is so funny because if I never came across that uh, magazine, Saturday Evening Post, and saw this photograph called The Runaway, that's what introduced me to photography by Norman Rockwell, yeah? I always documented American way of life, so I thought, you know, here I'm growing up in this small neighborhood at the time. Um, it was a time of the race riot and um, um, and the rise of the, 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 the Keep Britain White movement. You know, I thought, well, you know, I'll start documenting my community that I was growing up into. And then one thing leads to the other. I became a revolutionary, then I'd done the student rights, and to survive as a photographer, you had to become a paparazzi. And this is how I ended up all over the continent, you know? And this is when um, it grew on me. Huh? But coming back to London, I thought, well, I've got to document the community I grew up with, you know, and if you go in most Caribbean house, you know, they always have a photo album, and that's history itself. But the old generation never liked to talk about it, yeah? If you go in any West Indian living room, it's a history, it's like their own museum, especially the living room, which is a very important room, especially in the 60s. And you can pick up stories, and you can also um, analyze um, the passage they've been through. I wasn't really aware at the time of the power. Um, at the time, I used my camera sometimes to, as a survival, yeah? Um, I used my camera. In those days, it was a survival, if you can make a quick buck here and there, taking a snap of someone, yeah? But I wasn't aware of the journey at the time, you know, because at the time, it was mostly for survival. It's not till later years I realized and looking back at some of the documents I had, I realized that one day this will be of historical and uh, cultural value. It's not up to me to say, what do I want to remember? It's people in the room and what they want to remember me as, you know? I mean, I've uh, just probably uh, my contribution to the um, cultural changes of this country that's still been suppressed and my um, 
contribution to documenting our community history, even though it's a small part of London, it's just a minor part, you know. Um, but people can remember me with good, I don't know, with good thoughts, how they want to remember me. Different people have different opinions of me because I do other things as well, you know. And, um, you know, but I always like to give something back to my community and I hope oh, probably one day they'll treasure what I've given back to my community or what I've contributed to my community. That's probably, that should be reasonable enough.